PTSD talks about trauma, and we define a traumatic event as any kind of experience, exposure to, to what we call a traumatic experience, and that would be something life-threatening to you or some horror that you witness happening to others. All right? Either one of those events. At the time of the event, as it's occurring, you have these intense physical reactions. Your heart's beating, the adrenaline's flowing, your breathing changes, your musculature gets tight. You have intense emotional reactions. It could be anger, it could be fear, it could be rage, horror, disgust. Sometimes combinations of those reactions, depending on, on what the situation is. You're also thinking about the event. More often than not, you're just trying to make sense of it. There's a surreal quality to these experiences, where it actually, it's almost like you're looking at it from the outside. And there's incredible focus. That is to say, you're pretty much unaware of anything else other than this event as it's taking place. So at the time of the trauma, you have these intense physical reactions, emotional reactions, all these thoughts swimming through your head, this incredible focus, and then it ends. It can end in a heartbeat, um, like an IED explosion. It could go an extended period of time, like a sexual assault. But at some point it ends, and you kind of calm down. That is to say, you're not in that state that I just described. Uh, your heart's not beating. You, know, you don't have these intense emotions. It's not like you forgot what happened, and you still may be upset about it, but you're not in that same state. In many of the cases of, of trauma, there is no physical injury, believe it or not, particularly if you're witnessing something, or sometimes there could be something happening that threatens you that, that doesn't have any kind of physical harm. So more often than not, you can walk away from it unscathed. And you would think, I'm the same person I was. Nothing happened to me. I have no injuries. I have no scars. I have no wounds. But just from being in that state that I just described, with the intense emotions, the intense thoughts, the, the physical reactions, and the incredible focus, just from being in that state, changes can take place in the brain. Physical changes. If they put you into one of those scanners, certain areas of your brain would light up you know, that wouldn't ordinarily light up. And those are the areas that are usually associated with that uh, fight or flight syndrome, that fear response. And those changes are what cause the post-traumatic stress disorder. And eventually the symptoms begin. And I'm gonna talk about the symptoms, and there's a lot of them. And as I walk through them, what you realize is, although they seem to be scattered all over the place, in, in fact, they kind of all hang together. Part of it, is you get left in a wired state, all right? You might have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep. You start waking up in cold sweats. You begin to get nightmares. The nightmares are usually associated with the traumatic events, but sometimes they're just bizarre and make no sense at all. During the daytime, not when you're sleeping, you may see something or hear something or smell something that reminds you of what happened and you start thinking about it. But it's more than thinking about it. It's like a movie in your head. And it's not a movie you particularly want to see. When it comes to you, you get very uncomfortable. You get very anxious. You keep trying to push it away, but it's a tendency to kind of drift back. And sometimes you can be doing something, and there's nothing in your immediate surroundings that might remind you of what's happened. But nevertheless, these images come to you. And whenever they do, you get very uncomfortable. You keep trying to push them away. If I say the word memory to most people, they think about trying to remember something. This is the opposite. This is trying not to think of it, and it keeps coming at you. And in fact, you may hear things or smell things that were associated with the experience out of nowhere. Now, ordinarily, you know, you, you, some of you have been working on the inpatient unit. You'll typically see that with other diagnoses. Um, someone who's schizophrenic, for example. And these are auditory hallucinations, they are olfactory hallucinations, but they're not the same. They're always very specific to the event, and in fact, they are actual words or smells or sounds that they heard at the time. So it's different. It's a little bit like being awake in a dream. All right? And I talked about the fact that at times, uh, you'll have strong thoughts about the experience. This would be intrusive ideation. 
at times, they're actually back there. They're back there 100%. They see it, they hear it, they smell it. And that would be a flashback. So there's a distinction between an intrusive thought, which is a strong thought, and a flashback. But they both are invasive, and they both are not welcomed by the patient. When they're around other people, particularly if they don't know them, their heads on a swivel. They always want to know where everybody is. They don't want anybody to get behind them. All right? In fact, they don't trust anybody. But more important than that, what PTSD does is it destroys your sense that the world is safe. Okay? It destroys your sense that the world is safe. And it's an important concept to understand. If, if I were to take a walk outside with a PTSD patient walking around, we have trees and woods here, I'd be looking around trees, the sky's a nice day. The patient is constantly scanning, watching, looking. The idea that there is some threat to their safety is always on their mind, particularly if they're around people they don't know, if they're in some setting that's unfamiliar, they're watching, they're looking, they're scanning. If they're with someone they care about, they're worried about their safety. They're always thinking, what could happen? What's a danger to me? And, and they're planning what they're going to do with it, and it dominates their existence even more than they realize. People can say or do things, and they find themselves getting extremely angry. They may even have thoughts of hurting them. Most of the time, they'll sit there quietly. They might get up and walk away. The person who upset them might not even have a clue that they're reacting that way. And if you were to speak to them a little while later, they might tell you it doesn't even make sense to them why they were so angry. But it's not even a thought. It's almost like a, a physical reaction. The ideas come to them, and they come to them instantly. If someone were to touch them from behind or slam a door and they didn't expect it, they have what we call the startle response. Heart's pounding, adrenaline's flowing, they're ready to respond, and they're ready in an instant. I might view them standing there with a group of people, and from where I'm sitting, it might look like they're part of what's going on, that they're participating, but that's not their experience at all. There's really a sense of disconnect for them. There's a sense that they, they don't belong, that they're different than the people that they're with, and if you look closely, they're usually standing on the periphery, they're standing on the edge. And, and that general sense for them is that they don't belong, they don't fit in, and that there's a disconnect. And their one-to-one -one relationships are very much the same way. There's that same sense of disconnect. A lot of anger, a lot of fighting, a lot of cold silences. They hear things like, um, I don't know who you are. There's a wall there. The only, the only emotion you show is anger. And in fact, they feel anger and rage. They feel sadness and depression. And a lot of the time, they just feel numb. They don't feel anything. PTSD sort of destroys your ability to feel warm and fuzzy feelings. They can go through the motions. They might be able to connect up a little with their children. But generally speaking, they have difficulty feeling anything but the strong emotions. You'll often hear PTSD patients say things like, um, I went to a funeral. I knew I should feel sad. I didn't feel anything. So when they're not feeling the intense emotions, the rage, the depression, most of the time they go around feeling numb. Many PTSD patients have a lot of trouble with work. Um, typically they have problems at work with memory and concentration. Uh, typically there are substance abuse problems. I would say 95% or more of the patients that come here have a drug and alcohol history. But suppose they could, they could get past the, the concentration problems, get past the substance abuse problems, and actually get to work. The biggest problem they have are conflicts. Conflicts with bosses, conflicts with coworkers. Uh, if they're serving the public, things don't go so well there. The best work they'll do, and this is pretty consistent across the board, will be something that requires them to, to, to focus and concentrate something they're using in their hands. It doesn't have to be heavy lifting. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. And nobody's around. If they can keep their minds focused and their hands busy and not deal with other people, that's the best they're going to do. Over the course of the years, on this, in this program, when we've had people that have worked, it, it's been a couple of ways. Often we'll get people that fit that category I just told you. Uh, we had somebody here. Uh, that used to fix elevators. He'd be working in the shaft. He was very comfortable when he was in that shaft. He was totally surrounded. There was nobody near him. I had another gentleman that, that used to work underneath buildings, 
he used to fix the pipes there, the happiest he was. We had one here that was a hard hat diver. You know those fellows? He, he was down at the bottom of the ocean, he was in his hard hat suit, that's when he was happy. The, the other area of, of, of work that you see people is when they go into law enforcement. Okay, a lot of the, the people with PTSD, um, particularly if you're working with combat vets, it's, it sort of allows them to continue to function the way they did when they were in combat. Uh, the problem is sooner or later, they, they step over the line, sooner or later there are substance abuse issues, and then it pours out all over the place. People who have post-traumatic stress and don't know that they have it, or have they been, they've been told they have it, but don't really understand it the way we're talking about it today. In their own mind, they start to feel like they're going crazy. They can't sleep at night. Uh, they can't be around people. They can't stop thinking about things. They keep getting nightmares. They don't put all these symptoms together in a cohesive way. It's just randomly happening to them. In their heart of hearts, they start to feel like they're going crazy. So what they do is they begin to develop some strategies to deal with it. Some of them they do on purpose, and some of them they don't even realize. For one thing, they will avoid any situation that has the potential to remind them of the trauma, or if they find themselves in a situation that does remind them of it, they try to get out of it as quickly as possible. Okay? The avoidant behavior that you see in PTSD is always very specific to someone's trauma history. So you never know for sure what it means. If you're dealing with a combat vet, you can be sure 4th of July is not their favorite holiday. All right? And they'll tell you how they avoid what they do. Another thing they will do is turn to drugs and alcohol, as I mentioned. And the drugs and alcohol do not cure the PTSD, but they do provide some temporary relief of some of the symptoms. Uh, initially, when you start drinking and drugging, uh, it'll help you sleep, although eventually it will interfere with your sleep. But it blocks the thoughts reduces the anxiety, uh, maybe it helps you tolerate situations you otherwise wouldn't be able to stand, and then eventually you end up with a substance abuse problem. And the substance abuse problem is real, okay? And in some ways it stands on its own, but it's also sitting on top of the PTSD. So when they get clean and they stop using, the PTSD gets much worse. They have more trouble with the nightmares, more trouble with the anxiety, more trouble with the sleep disturbance, and all the other associated symptoms. So it's very hard to stay clean when you have PTSD, the drugs, the alcohol, they're addictive. They'll crave them physically and psychologically. But more to the point, once they stop using, their PTSD symptoms get worse because all they're really doing is self-medicating and usually they don't realize it. Another thing they'll do is, is, is start staying by themselves more and more as time goes by. Right? They start isolating. And the isolation serves several functions. For one thing, if they can stay in some area that's secure, some place behind locked doors, it makes them feel safer. The, the truth of the matter is, people with PTSD never really feel safe. Right? It just reduces the threat. If you're behind locked doors, you have to keep checking and scanning and watching. Uh, they, they end up looking through peepholes, they end up looking through the windows all the time, but it does reduce it somewhat. People with PTSD are big into safety. They're always making sure the doors are locked, windows are secure. When they walk into a place they've never been, the first thing they do is they get their back to the wall, they make sure they know where the exits are, they're figuring out how to get out of there even before they get in. So part of the isolation has to do with safety. The other part of the isolation has to do with anger. All right? If not around anybody, there's nobody to get angry with. And since they don't even know what it is that's going to make them angry, and the intensity of the anger is so strong that it's a little scary to them, one way to kind of keep it under control is either stay away from people altogether or limit your contact to people that you feel are not going to be any threat. Let me, I'll give you a chance to ask any questions at this point. Sure. Um, do you ever have cases where um, we talked about there having to be an identifiable trauma that happened to the patient? Um, what happens when there's multiple trauma, like distinct? Traumas, okay. so how does that affect Well, it, it, it compounds, okay? So the changes in the brain that take place, they continue to take place as there's more traumas. Most of the, the, the patients we see here have had multiple traumas. And I will also say that, that in, it's a surprising amount of patients we've seen here that have had early childhood trauma. 
as well as sexual trauma. If you've had trauma early on, it, it makes you much more vulnerable mm -hmm. to trauma later in life. Well, one thing about trauma is, is that it's a subjective experience. You know, you and I could go through the exact same situation and you can walk away with PTSD and I can walk away unscathed. Uh, I worked with a patient who, who this is in, in private practice, uh, he was a, a police officer that was on the emergency response team. His job was, was breaking through the doors uh, when they had to go uh, after people, and, and he was about a six foot four big guy, but his partner was six eight. So he always had to go through the door first, because the partner had to see over him, because they'd both be going in at the same time. He, he removed bodies from cars and, and, and train wrecks. You know, he saw all kinds of horrible things. He had no signs of PTSD, zero. He came to me because he had problems with his mar in marital situation. So, so PTSD is unique in the sense that you can't, in some ways it isn't unique because you know, people get exposed to bacteria and viruses. Some people get sick and some people don't. Some people have a natural resistance to it. But if you've had early childhood trauma, you're much more susceptible to having trauma later in life. A any other questions for now? There are usually like a time frame, like when you see it? Usually, in order for it to be a diagnosis of PTSD, uh, usually it has to be at least 30 days after the event oh, okay. to start having the symptoms. When, when we do the assessments, the, 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 a lot of the questions we ask are specifically about the symptoms. But there are some questions that will work all the time that, that what's good is because it doesn't give the patient an idea of what the right answer is. All right? For example, if you ask a patient if he goes to a restaurant where he sits, all right, someone who has PTSD will always say, I sit in the back, I have to keep my back to the wall, I have to see the exits. If they don't see that, it's doubtful that they have PTSD. All right? We usually check to see whether or not they're hearing voices, and one of the more common symptoms are the olfactory. Even more so than, than, than if, if somebody's been in a situation where there's been explosions or gunshots, they might hear that. But the smells associated with a particular trauma seem to linger and stick with the patient much more. And they will often smell this at times when there's nothing around to actually cause the smell. I've worked with a lot of the, the men and women that were down at the 9-11 site. And some of them were not even there when the planes hit. They, they were came afterwards and were cleaning up and day after day. And after a while, uh, they start, they can't sleep at night, mm -hmm. they're starting to smell it, uh, they're getting irritable, they pick up uh, on drugs or alcohol, and they end up with PTSD even though they weren't there when, when the actual event took place. Now, the, the DSM has changed uh, just within the last year. And they, they, for the first time, they've expanded the definition of PTSD. It used to be limited strictly to what I said to you, which was uh, witnessing uh, some kind of horror or having some kind of life-threatening event. What they added for the first time was that if you are informed of an event that happened to somebody very close to you, usually uh, a child, a spouse, and it, it has some kind of horrific quality, like uh, a child is kidnapped and murdered, Okay. It, it wouldn't count if you were told that your cousin Louis died in uh, his sleep one night or some kind of normal thing. But if, if you're described an event of somebody that you know well and you're given details of it, that's acceptable as a traumatic event. It was never before. But it actually makes a lot of sense because you can imagine if someone hears of their child being tortured that you would end up with the symptoms of PTSD.